everyone, and welcome to Booked Solid Podcast. We're your host, I'm India. And I'm Soraya, and today we're going to be covering The Family Upstairs by Lisa Jewell. But before we get started, we just want to say a huge thank you to everyone who came out and listened to our first two episodes. We really love reading your reviews, seeing what you had to say, and reading what you had to say over on our Facebook page. As you may have known, we were running a giveaway last week. To enter, you just had to subscribe and leave us a rating and review. And we said we would pick one at random and read it on the show, and that person would get a $25 Barnes & Noble gift card. So that is exactly what we did. And the winner from last week, the username is Simone, S-I parentheses M-O-N-E. And this is what they had to say. These ladies have created something completely incredible here. I've never been a part of a book club before, so this is my first ever experience. And I have to say, it was absolutely wonderful. They captured the book and the show in such great depth, from the characters to the author, the overall production and the backgrounds as well. It was honestly amazing. I felt so involved with just hearing the two of them speak and bounce their opinions off of each other, and I could relate so much to what they were saying, as well as how they were feeling, and I really enjoyed the comparisons they made between not only the show and the book, but real-life experiences as well. This was a great first episode, a great first experience with book clubs and podcasts for me, and I very much look forward to what they have next in store. So, Simone, thank you so much. Please send us an email at booksolidpodcast at gmail.com, just confirming who you are and that it was in fact your review and we will send you over a $25 gift card. As we mentioned on our Instagram and in our last giveaway, we will be doing three in honor of our launch. So that was the end of the first one. So the second one starts today, Monday, August 3rd with this episode. And we wanted to make it a little more inclusive because we didn't realize um, prior to our last giveaway that you can only leave reviews on Apple Podcasts. So to enter this time, all you have to do is subscribe to us wherever you're listening. If you want to leave a review, that's great. That's encouraged, but it's not required. And so all you will need to do is email us a screenshot confirming that you are indeed subscribed. And just like with our uh, previous giveaway, all of the information will be in the podcast show notes. Spoiler alert. Hey guys, just as a heads up, we will be revealing spoilers in this episode. If you haven't yet read the book or seen the show or film, this is a courteous reminder to proceed with caution. So, the family upstairs. Um, I just want to say I was not expecting that at all. I would agree. The phrase, don't judge a book by its cover, has never been more true for me than with this book, Mm -hmm. honestly. Yeah, I was just expecting, you know, regular mystery kind of novel, but some of these twists... Yeah, we got into a whole nother, like, realm of story here. I've read, which is funny because I don't think I realized that they were both by the same author, because I've read two other books by Lisa Jewell that I enjoyed. It was Watching You and Then She Was Gone. Okay. And, yeah, I really enjoyed Then She Was Gone was crazy. I listened to that one on audiobook. And then um, Watching You, I also really enjoyed. So I was like, okay, I know I like this author. And so at the start of it, I was, I, I will be honest that I kind of had a little bit of trouble getting into the storyline mm-hmm. and just maintaining my focus on it. And then we hit a point where I was like, okay, buckle up because this <laughs> is absolutely insane. Yeah, the whole cult aspect, which we're going to get into in a little bit. I didn't see that coming at all. And like, Mm -mm. I've always been so fascinated with cult stories because, I mean, just in general, I love like scary movies, horror. I'm a scaredy cat all the way, but I still always like (laughs) watch them and read those types of books. And so I remember I was watching this Netflix show. I can't remember Mind Hunters. Yeah. I was watching Mind Hunters on Netflix, and the premise of the show is like it talks about how the FBI was created, and like the main character studies serial killers, sociopaths. The the one about the behavioral analysis unit, right? Yes. Okay, yes. yes. It's it's on my list. One of my friends, he's constantly telling me to watch it, and like I know it's a fictional show, but I love Criminal Minds, and they are part of the Mm -hmm. BAU. So, okay, yeah. Yes, exactly. And so um, I won't spoil it. (laughs) I won't get into it too much. But he does kind of talk about the mentality of cult leaders at one point, the main character. Mm -hmm. And I was just kind of thinking about that because the character of David Thompson, he happens to be a cult leader in a way. And so, I don't know, just that whole aspect threw me for a loop. 
the identity of the characters. We're introduced to them as one person. And then in the middle of the book, we realized that they were actually this other person. By the end of the book, we realized they were using an alias or another hidden identity. And so, yeah, just it made for an interesting read. I will say, too, in the beginning, I wasn't as, I guess, connected to it. But I think like by the time you get to the halfway point in the book, something happens. And so, you know, once I reached that point, I couldn't stop reading, you know. But before we get further into things, I wanted to get your thoughts on Libby. Well, I want to say real quick, there's a movie with Elizabeth Olsen called Martha Marcy May Marlene, which Mm. is... I had a lot of feelings when I watched it and it's about she's the main character and she escapes from this cult and it's just kind of following her journey after that. I don't want to give anything else away, so I'm not going to over explain it, but I would highly recommend it and let's chat about that. If anyone else is interested, please go watch it and comment on our Instagram or something and let us know what you think because I had a lot of feelings about that. It's not a book, but it's applicable to what we're talking about. Okay, I'm I'm going to check that out. And one thing, since we're on the topic of relevant films, have you seen Parasite? I have. And I was thinking about that while I was reading. You can't see me, but I'm smiling big right now because instantly, like, I mean, I'm not going to say, like, towards the end, I don't know if the parallels could be drawn still, but the Definitely themes, in the beginning. Yes. I was like, Parasite, Parasite! Oh my gosh, this is mm-hmm. Parasite! And just even, like, the way that it's, like, the humor, the way humor is laced into this story that's pretty dark. Like, there was times when I was watching Parasite where I laughed out loud. I'm like, what? Like, this is so crazy. And definitely was getting Parasite vibes when Birdie gets introduced. Yes. Oh. <laughs> that's oh, exactly... Yeah, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll get into it. Um, so Libby, her character initially, there were things about her character that I definitely related to. And I was like, I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing, Mm -hmm. because there are parts of her character that she doesn't even necessarily like, like her need for constant structure, plan, routine. I was like, oh my gosh, that's me to a T. And it's not the best thing in the world, because like anytime anything doesn't go according to plan, which is always, um, (laughs) it can make life difficult. But yeah, so I definitely say I, um kind of related to her in that aspect she kind of took it to another level like when she was talking (laughs) about her future husband you know her whole list of requirements for him yes um and like she'd outline the next you know five to ten years of her life so when we were first introduced to her i didn't know how i was gonna feel i was like okay i don't really know if i like her but i I liked her character development throughout the book yeah i agree yeah i feel like she was written well And then just what you were saying with her need for structure in her life, I thought it was very interesting because her, I'll just say this, her boss, I think her name is pronounced Dito. Shout out Mm -hmm. to Dito. 10 out of 10 Mm -hmm. would recommend. But at one point she says, I've noticed Libby, or she said like, I'm going to miss the way that you always adjust the paper stacks. Yeah, your neat paper stacks. Yeah. And so I felt like that was a perfect visual because I've never heard anyone describe anyone that way. (laughs) But I just picture her like, you know, she appreciates structure in her life. And so the fact that she's thrown into this completely unstructured, Mm -hmm. chaotic situation once she turns 25. And so then we kind of like enter Lucy. Lucy gets a notification on her phone that says the baby has turned 25 very ominous notification (laughs) yeah which also i thought it was interesting how um so lucy has two young children marco Mm -hmm. who's 12 i think and then stella wait no that's not her Mm -hmm. name yeah yeah yeah, you're right oh okay yes because we had a stella in the last book just trying to make sure i'm keeping everything good but yeah so i thought it was interesting how marco sees the notification on her screen and was like the baby what Like, what's going on? 21 questions. (laughs) Yeah. So, yeah, you know, she gets this notification, but Lucy is going through it. Like, Libby thought she was going through it. Lucy is going through it at this stage in her Mm -hmm. life. It's funny because when they first introduced Lucy as a character, I really wasn't sure how I felt about her. And I think, you know, Lisa Jewell probably did this on purpose, but... It's it's even said on the like in the description for the book. Libby is on a collision course to meet the other people in this story. Mm. And so we're following this journey of all of these characters finally coming together. But for me, while I was reading it, I could not tell what their characters' intentions were. And so, you know, Lucy gets that the baby is 25 notification and we see that she's kind of making moves to get back to London. So I'm like, are they gonna come after Lucy to try to like 
hurt her into getting the inheritance? Are they going to blackmail her? Like, I didn't know what their yeah. intentions were. So that was just another element that really kept me on my toes the whole time of, do I support Lucy and Henry or... Yeah, and I think it's really interesting, too, just because... So we know, you know, Libby, she's a working-class woman. I picture she's probably able to make ends meet, but, you know, she's not She's not going to be out here buying a Tesla or anything like that, mm-hmm. either. But then we know Lucy's situation is very dire. And mm-hmm. um, for the most part, at this point in the story, she's homeless, and she's living mm-hmm. with her two kids. She plays the fiddle to earn money but she was attacked by a group of men and they broke her fiddle and so at this point she doesn't have any money so yeah she's just she's in a terrible situation um and so when she gets this notification i was thinking that too because i'm like well libby you think you could use seven million right now but lucy's really i mean and she has the young kids and fits like she she can use (laughs) the seven million right now but then again who is this woman you know yeah, and, and we don't know her relation to Libby. Well, I guess we, we, are, we are to assume at that point that that's their sister. Mm-hmm. So I guess we can just tackle it by the past and then what happened in the present. Mm-hmm. So in the past, I think Henry's narration at the beginning of the book was actually pretty... It was kind of comical to me at parts. Like, mm-hmm. I don't know, some of his little one-liners are just the perspective of the world from this like somewhat sassy 11 year old like, I don't know, just when we first get, get things from henry's point of view it's it's a little comical to me and a little interesting as time progresses um i have a lot of questions and comments about henry but i guess first let's just talk about what's going on in the what's their last name oh lamb yeah let's talk about what's going on in the lamb household so you know when we start from Henry's point of view, their life is fairly, I mean, they're wealthy, they're well off, their dad inherited his father's lottery winnings, and he's pretty gaudy and tacky about it. So, Mm -hmm. you know, they have a lot of excess stuff in a huge house and tons of furniture, and they're flashy. And then we enter Birdie. Mm -hmm. Really quickly, I just want to add, I 100% agree. I remember writing down He's probably the most interesting storyline, if I'm being honest. (laughs) Like, that's what I wrote in my notes when we hear 11-year-old Henry's little voice. But he specifically says off the jump, for whatever reason, he just gets a bad feeling about Birdie. He doesn't like her. He wants her to leave. He's constantly asking, when is she going to leave? So, yes, Birdie and her band come in to film the video. I can't remember if it says how they ended up staying there. Do you remember? Yes. So she, they filmed the music video and then conveniently her and her boyfriend, Justin, who's also in the band, they get evicted from their apartment Mm. because they didn't read the contract that pets weren't allowed. I think the thing that surprised me the most with the addition of each new character who was allowed, characters that was allowed to stay in their home, I guess I could kind of see how Martina would fall for it or like let it happen. Mm -hmm. I was really surprised Henry Sr., was down with that. Right. Just like, I don't know. The descriptions that young Henry gave of him, I know he said he wanted kind of people to be aware of his wealth and maybe that's what influenced his decision is like, oh, I'm so wealthy. Like, I'll let these people stay with me to see how kind I am or how, or to see how much I have to go around. Mm-hmm. But aside from that, like, he just, he seemed kind of no nonsense. So I was yeah. really surprised that he let them stay for that long as well as letting other people stay after that. Yeah, I agree. When I was trying to keep track of all the characters in my notes, I described Henry Sr. as a grizzly bear. I just (laughs) pictured, I'm like, here's this guy who, like you said, like no nonsense. He's very into hunting. He has all kinds of, you know, his trophies throughout the house from what I understand. And I'm like, yeah, I, I don't see that. But then again, there's a point in the story when him and Henry are talking And I think his whole thing was he just wanted to please Martina and he wanted to make her happy. Martina was like the one thing that could sway Henry Sr.'s opinion. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I would say that, so, you know, we have Birdie and Justin now living there. That's two additional people. And then shortly after, Henry Sr. has a stroke. And I think if I'm remembering correctly, that they didn't have insurance or something anymore Bertie was like, well, you know, I know someone who deals with energies and he can help heal you. And that is where we meet the Thompsons. Yeah, I just want to add really quickly, that part really confused me. And early on, I was thinking to myself, has Bertie somehow kind of found a way to 
obtain their wealth because we never really got into, or at that point in the book, Lisa Jewell didn't really explicitly say how they lost all this money. And Mm -hmm. so I'm like, I understand he had a stroke, but from what I understand, even before the stroke, their money was slowly declining. It kind of seems to me that they weren't really responsible with their money. Mm -hmm. Like neither of them, I mean, Martina had her PR business for like a year or something, her fashion PR business. But aside from that, they weren't working. And Henry Sr. lived a very extravagant, well, they all lived a very extravagant lifestyle. And the money he was living on, it was a limited quantity. I mean, like it was a lot of money. But it's a limited quantity. I think they were just kind of running out of money because they weren't bringing anything in, but they were spending like crazy. But like you said, enter the Thompsons. I think it's really interesting that Henry, even at, uh, I think he's almost 12 by this point, noticed the power dynamic between Mm -hmm. David and his dad and the rest of the family. They, the, from the second they arrived, they had dinner that night and he could tell that this was going to be bad news. He didn't know why and how yet, but he just knew that this was going to be an issue. Yeah, the power dynamic with the Thompsons. And I, again, I was kind of wondering to myself, but they do emphasize that Henry Sr. is not himself after the first stroke. Mm-hmm. Um, it was interesting that, and kind of like in Parasite, like they just keep allowing more and more people to you know, kind of pick up residency in this mansion. Yeah, well, that's what I was going to say when we enter. So as soon as Bertie said, I know someone who can help you with Henry Sr.'s rehabilitation. Mm -hmm. Just the way she went about it immediately made me think of Parasite. And now who does she know who she can help bring in to manipulate the situation further? Like, it's just immediately what it made me think of. So when you said it, I was like, okay, I'm so glad I wasn't the only one who thought that. Yes. And I was just thinking, and even like the kind of tongue-in-cheek humor, because I feel like you know, most readers are going to be like, I don't trust Birdie because of how Henry's described her and later Finn. And then the fact that she just knows all these people, I feel like they were, I felt like early on they were trying to take advantage of the lambs, but I didn't realize the extent. But I was like, this is just like Parasite. Yeah. And I would have to say too, something that so, I mean, as you all know, as you've read the book, the Thompsons, and Birdie and Justin, and not even so much Justin. We're going to leave him out because, you know what? I actually kind of like Justin. Same. Birdie and the Thompsons, they just mm-hmm. kind of slowly but surely take over. And something that was really hard to read was the manipulation of the family, how they all fell victim to it. I mean, aside from Henry, they took a vulnerable situation and they you know, abused and manipulated this family just to see like the the literal brainwashing that was occurring. Like so many times Henry was telling his mom, what are you doing? Why are you allowing this to happen? Tell them to leave, do something. The manipulation was pretty severe at this point. And Henry was trying to get his mom to wake up and see what was happening. Mm-hmm. And she was just like, oh, I'm just so sorry that they didn't come into our lives sooner. And I was like, what? Like, I'm assuming most of you who are listening have read the book, but just to see the takeover, like when Henry was talking about the list of rules, no haircuts, everyone had to be vegan. They Mm -hmm. all had to wear the same black tunic and black pants every day. They were not allowed to use anything of the earth because, or they could, they were not allowed to use anything not from the earth because then it would be gluttonous and there were people who could use it more than them. So they had to get rid of all of their possessions, all Mm -hmm. of their clothes, their shoes. They controlled what time they ate, how they ate, how much they ate, who ate what. And it just became a cult. That's the only way I can think of to describe it. Yeah. And I think Henry even said that to his mom, like, what, is this like a commune now? And she like flipped out. She's like, don't let anybody hear you saying that. Um, We should be grateful to David Thompson. He's opened my eyes for me to see what a wasteful life I used to live. And I was so unhappy before he came. And now he's made every day better for me. And it's also kind of going with with what you were saying. I felt the same way with wondering, like, how did Martina, you know, get to that point? Because Mm -hmm. early on when they first entered the house, Henry commented on how he noticed that she was holding back, trying to avoid being around David because she knew that she would be subject to, like, his Mm -hmm. cool and charm or whatever. And so at that point in the story, when he asked her and like, what's going on? You know, we're basically in a commune. And to see her reaction, that was classic horror movie, because there's always that point when you realize or the main character realizes that they're screwed and that they're stuck. And so I'm not 
I'm not justifying by any means what we'll get into later, how Henry kind of turns out into his in his adult life. However, he really felt like in that moment, you know, he's trapped in this house, quite literally trapped, because one of those rules was they can't leave the house at certain times. Eventually, there's locks. There's all these locks on the door. Mm-hmm. So there's locks on the front door, so you can't mm-hmm. even leave the house if you want to. And it was just so... It was hard to read. It made me feel genuinely sick at some parts because Henry was begging for his parents to wake up and see what was happening to them, see what was happening to their children, to their household, to their life, and they just couldn't. They couldn't see it. And I can't imagine that feeling of being trapped in your circumstances that way, of seemingly being the only person who realizes the extent of what's happening and there's nothing you can do about it because your own parents have fallen victim. Yeah, like it doesn't justify what Henry goes on to do, but Mm -hmm. also just the fact that like, so he stops having contact with the outside world, they all do. And so his decision making is just kind of instinct. You know, Sally was their teacher at one point, and then she stops teaching them. And so he's really just left to come to things on his own. And so, Mm -hmm. again, I'm not like justifying what he does, but I genuinely don't know Or I'm trying to think how else it could have played out given the circumstances. Yeah, I was going to say the progression, it almost became animalistic, which Mm -hmm. is like what you can... If you lock someone in a house so they never can go outside, they can never speak to anyone else, they never see anyone else, they're malnourished. He talks about how thin they all get because David and Bertie are controlling the food they can eat. You start to feel, I imagine, like a caged animal, and that's Mm -hmm. exactly what he began to act like. And with each chapter um, that we got from Henry's perspective, what blew my mind was how long they lived like that. Mm -hmm. For some reason, I think I was under the impression it was only going to be a couple months or a couple years. Five years that they lived like that. And I actually just remembered, because I was talking about the part where you could just see the complete and total brainwashing of Martina. I -hmm. thought it was when Henry approached her. And I don't think it was. It was when... um, So, as you know, Bertie was with Justin, Sally was married to David, and Henry sees Bertie and David kissing. Long story short, he and Finn end up doing LSD. Finn, while they're tripping, tells everybody in the house what he saw, and Sally leaves. And as you mentioned, Sally was their homeschool teacher. So, once Sally leaves, they stop going to school because Mm -hmm. they have no one teaching them and then that's when things really start to spiral out of control because David and Bertie together are just like the most toxic combination but there's a point when things start getting bad David starts hitting Finn David starts being more controlling and Sally's crying to Martina telling her like please watch out for my children here I'm so worried for them I'm scared for them but I can't take them with me because I don't even have a place to live Mm -hmm. and she's telling Martina how worried she is about what David is doing to them And Martina, that's when she tells her, like, oh, David has been such a positive influence in our lives. He's changed my life so much, and I just wish he'd come into our life sooner. And that showed me just how far gone she was. If Sally is crying, her husband has left her for someone else. She's worried about the safety of her children. She's telling you that this man is a threat to her children. And all you can think of to do is sing his praises and say, oh, I wish he came into our lives sooner. And just because, you know, at that point, we also learned that the Thompsons have a history of doing this. So I don't really know like the extent to which Sally was complicit in their previous schemes. You know, their last stint, they end up getting kicked out because it's, they they get exposed for stealing. Mm -hmm. And so Sally now saying, cause she knows what David's capable of and she knows his ulterior motives. And so for her to be that scared in that moment and to see Martina, she's like, no, like you're hundred percent wrong. You should, um, we should have trusted him sooner. We can feel Henry's frustration even more so because she's been completely brainwashed. Like you said. Yeah. Let's talk about, I guess, Justin for a little bit, because yeah. it's interesting to me because on one hand, I feel like Justin, aside from Henry, was the one other person who kind of, I don't want to say served as a voice of reason, but maybe was aware of what was happening and wanted to be removed from it. But what's strange about Justin is even after he finds out about Bertie and David, Bertie and David move into the same room. Justin continues to live in the house. I know Justin can see the control that's being exerted throughout the entire house by Bertie and David, but he continues to stay and he doesn't stick up for anyone. Yeah. Like, you know, he and Henry just kind of form this bond. He takes Henry under his wing as like his little apprentice. But to me, like, if you can see these kids are 
no longer being taught. They're hardly being fed. They're not being treated very well. Like you're staying in the household. So in a way you are complicit and you're not even doing anything about it. You're not standing up to David. You're not trying to help Martina. You're not protecting the children. Yeah, I'm glad you brought him up just because, yeah, I, I would say I liked him and I liked the relationship he had with Henry and that he could be kind of like the one person in the house at that time that he could be completely transparent with, be open mm -hmm. with. But I felt like the biggest issue with Justin is that he was too weak. And mm. I think that's how him and Birdie even came about because at one point they were getting into the backstory of Birdie's life and how she, from what I understand, everyone in their pop band hated her. Yeah. But she was powerful and she was able to control everything and they hated her because she was controlling. And so I felt like because Justin was just kind of weak minded, he he wasn't strong enough and he never really had the the fire and the ambition to try and challenge her. Um, and so he just kind of went along with things. And like you said, he was complicit. And so it was unfortunate because... You know, he is kind of like an ally and I'm, you know, I'm, I'm rooting for you, Justin. But then to see that he literally doesn't do anything. And at this point, he's one of, you know, a handful of adults in the house. But to know that he's completely powerless and, you know, he doesn't have the fire and the drive to challenge any of the structures going on, any of the power structures. It was kind of a disappointment and a letdown. And I'm not surprised that, you know, he goes on to run away I like what you said about Justin being weak and because Birdie was not. I wouldn't say she was strong in a good way because she didn't use her strength to improve herself. She used her strength to control others. I think that is why she was probably drawn to David because he was also a strong presence, a very, you know, manipulative presence. And I think maybe she saw just things in him of what she and he could do together as opposed to what she could do with Justin. And I think you're right. I think it all really had to do with the power behind each man and what she believed they were capable of. Yeah. So, you know, at this point, Justin leaves. He had this massive garden. Um, he was selling his kind of like creations as a source of income. And so he leaves the garden and he leaves the, these books with Henry, who he's kind of taken up under his wing. Henry has this growing knowledge of herbs and recipes and remedies. And so at this point, Martina becomes pregnant. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And Henry's in complete shock. Lucy bursts into tears and Clemency runs down the hallway to throw up, which all appropriate reactions to what's <laughs> happening in this house. <laughs> right. Henry pretty much is like, I saw this coming. He said he could tell the way that his mom was looking at David and it's, David is so disgusting to me, just absolutely disgusting. And so then to see Martina, like I, we've said it so many times, we're going to keep saying it, the way she fell into the trap that he laid, he took a vulnerable person and he really, really took advantage of that. Mm -hmm. What we know is David is using this to cement his place in the household and to ensure that he can take Henry Sr. and Martina's home when they pass. But this is a, a power move. And the fact that this life form is being brought into this terrible little society that has been created it, it's awful you know at this point in the book i was like okay there's there's no turning back until we find out that henry this part of the book was hard to read but henry creates this concoction that is essentially a means of aborting the baby and he starts mm -hmm. to serve it to his mom pretty regularly and then she miscarries and it happens over the course of five days and henry has kind of concluded at this point that his recipes and remedies that he's given her is the reason for this in henry's mind he thought and i think henry's 14 at this point maybe around yeah, there maybe like 13 14 and his logic was he wants David and Bertie gone. That's all he wants for them out of his home. And so in, in his mind, he's, he thinks that if Martina and David have this baby, David will never leave. And mm -hmm. so the way he tries to justify it to himself, again, I'm not saying whether it's right or wrong. I'm simply just saying like what Henry believed. Yeah. He thought the only way to save his family was to get rid of 
this child because he thought that if they have this child, it will cement David's position in this house. He will never leave. I will never have my family back. So that is what he resorted to. And then she does end up miscarrying. And so to Henry's surprise, though, David does not leave. And so then after Martina miscarries her and David's baby, that is when she checks out. So any hope of Martina realizing what David and Bertie are doing to their family goes out the window at that point. And I feel like she also just begins to fade. And I think that's kind of how Henry describes her. She just becomes a ghost of her former self. Yeah. I mean, the jury's out on if Henry's concoction is, in fact, what caused the miscarry because... Mm -hmm. They also weren't, so, you know, they had no connection with the outside world. She wasn't getting regular doctor checkups, things of that Mm -hmm. nature. And this is, like, early 90s, I believe. Also, like, their only suggestion, which which I thought was really, like, just strange, and I'm just trying to get a a mental picture when I was reading it. While uh, Martina was pregnant, they just kept overfeeding her. And what was coming to my mind was, um, I don't know if you've seen Matilda, uh, <laughs> Side note, though, I don't remember the little girl's name in Matilda, but there's people tell me I look like her all the time. Oh, I, I know who you're talking about. Let me look it up real quick. I've only <laughs> seen it once. Okay, Lavender. That's her name. And I've um, gotten that so many times. Like, one of my friends sent me a screenshot when he was watching it. He's like, dang, I didn't know you were in Matilda. And then this one time, a complete stranger, he was like, do you know who you look like? And I was like, no. Who? He's like, you look like that little girl from Matilda. And I was like, Okay. Okay, thanks. Like, yeah, I guess as far as characters go, it could be worse. Yeah. Um, but yeah, just um, just bringing up Matilda because of just the way that food's depicted in that entire movie. I was getting this, like, similar vibes. And, you know, while they're not going to give her any medical treatment whatsoever, no, probably no prenatal vitamins or anything like that, they're just going to, you know, overfeed her and gorge her essentially on these not very healthy foods that was that was a lot to process because it it went against their so-called philosophies and morals yeah Bertie and david when henry ends up getting into their room and seeing all the stuff they claimed to have given away Mm -hmm. like meanwhile everyone in the house has no shoes barely any food uh can't get haircuts can't like pick a thing you name it they can't do it but Mm -hmm. meanwhile in Bertie and david's room they have hoarded all of martina and henry seniors jewelry their decorations they have alcohol they have non-vegan food they have real underwear they have their own shoes and to me it just showed like birdie and david are absolutely insane like they are sadistic it's one thing if they're doing these things and they honestly believe that what they're doing is good and right you know what i mean like the the Mm -hmm. whole system that they're preaching to everyone in the house of you know needing to be aware of one's own waste and you need to give back and you need to live a very like non-wasteful lifestyle if they actually believe that i mean i don't agree with the extent to which they're going because i mean Mm -hmm. i think we all could be more aware of what we produce and you know how we live in this world that's fine that could be one thing but the fact that they are saying this they're forcing these people to live this way and then they themselves are still living however they want they're watching these kids their weight is falling off of them finn is sick because he's Mm -hmm. so malnourished and i mean for other reasons we'll get into but you're seeing what's happening to your own children and you are still you don't care you're just making sure that you're set up with your finances and you're set up getting to live how you want, meanwhile ruining the lives of six other people. Right. And it's just so interesting because I'm glad you brought that up, but some of their principles were kind of interesting. And I felt like they're, you know, they're good thinking points and talking points. Just seeing David's hold on the family and seeing the fact that both him and Birdie, for whatever reason, feel like they have the power to dictate all these people's lives like they're kind of like playing god in a way that's so disturbing and yeah that point when henry sees all of that i think that was like the point of no return yeah it was just um very telling of who birdie and david are It's, it's okay to go against the grain or to see an alternate way of thinking and live that way however the way that they force it upon other people and the way that they don't even practice it themselves that Mm -hmm. tells us that it's not about you know living another lifestyle for 
the supposed betterment of themselves as people, but it's more so about control and power. Yes. Yeah, so taking our way back to the pregnancy, so we're saying, you know, that's really the moment when I feel like Martina kind of checks out. And like we said, she just she doesn't recover from the pain of losing her third child. And so we think, like Henry thinks, will this be it? Will David pack it up? Will he go? He's in too deep at this point, and I think he knows the hold that he has on the family. So what does this 40-plus-year-old man do? He impregnates 14-year-old Lucy. I closed the book. I stepped away. I went to get some water. I went to, you know, look outside the window because, you know, this is just classic cult leader. You know, this is what he's going to do. He's losing power, so he goes another way. But I remember Henry specifically saying, Lucy had just turned 14, and I believe David was 41. The fact that Martina doesn't see anything wrong with that, Henry Sr. at this point, I think he's completely nonverbal. He communicates via a series of blinking, or like they kind of had that system going. But just to know, like you said, the control that he had, no one saw nothing wrong with that. And even Lucy herself, because, you know, up until that point, we don't really hear much about Lucy, Henry's sister, and Clemency, we knew that they were pretty close friends, but we didn't really know the extent to how they were interpreting everything until now. And so we kind of, it's kind of confirmed that, I mean, Clemency was very upset as she was when she found out about Martina, but to see that Lucy has also been brainwashed, Henry's like, this is my sister, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Henry confronts their mom. She said, "You let." He said, "You let your daughter have sex with a man the same age as you. That is just sick." And she said, "It has nothing to do with me. All I know is a baby is coming, and we should all be very happy." Mm. So that's exactly what happens: is Lucy carries this baby to term, and she gives birth. And then I think they said, like the next day or a couple days after she gave birth, they took the baby from Lucy, moved Lucy back into her room with Clemency, and the baby moved into David and Bertie's room. Mm. And I think Henry said that was finally the moment where Lucy appeared to wake up because I think she was under the impression that she was going to get to keep her own child. And now she's finally realizing like, okay, they won't stop until they've taken absolutely everything from us. While we're talking about Henry, I just want to, I guess our final thing to, or one of the last things to say about him in the past too is his and Finn's relationship. Mm Mm-hmm. Like we said, it started out very innocent. It seemed like just a crush. And then it became an infatuation. And then it became an obsession. Mm -hmm. And just to see that progression. And it's so funny because I saw this brought up and I kind of wanted to talk to you about it was Henry hates David, but they seem to share similar personality traits. Yeah, I 100% agree. I think his, because, you know, he's studying David. He's trying to find a way to get out of this house he starts to kind of become him in a way. He starts to, you know, develop some of his crazy power techniques and the way that he's able to manipulate people. Yeah, yeah. And he starts manipulating even the other three children by the end of the book. Exactly. In the way that they're going to escape their situation, he becomes very much like David. Exactly. And there's even a part at the very end when they're about to leave the mansion. Basically, it's described that Henry stands above the rest of the kids and he's like, kind of the power figure in that moment. He's the one, the voice that they're looking to for guidance. Henry is now, you know, paralleling David in a way that I would have never saw chapters ago and I would have never hoped for because Henry was once my favorite character and now he's kind of hungry with power and not even so much by intent, but by just the way that things played out. He kind of came the voice of the rebellion in a sense. But I was just thinking to myself, like, you are paralleling David. <laughs> like, I hope you know that. Yeah, for sure. Like you said, he was kind of the ringleader. He was the mastermind. He's the one who came up with this plan in the first place and kind of got everyone to go along with it and got everyone to cover up, you know, these four deaths. And it's interesting, too, because I love me an unreliable narrator, and that is mm-hmm. Henry to a T. So it's just so hard to know, like, do I, be- do I believe that Henry accidentally killed him? I don't think so. I think he knew exactly what he was doing. Oh, you do? I kind of think that he killed them on purpose. That's interesting. I don't know. I, I'm not sure I really thought too much into it. I wouldn't be surprised if he did it on purpose, but I felt like in that moment, his intentions were pure and he was just so focused on, you know, getting the kids out. 
that that happened. But the only reason why I say that is because I thought to myself and I wrote this down. I was like, why would he kill his dad, Henry Sr.? To even begin with, I was like, why would he even sedate Henry Sr.? From what I understand, he was pretty much immobile. He couldn't speak. So I was like, it's not really necessary. Like, that's kind of overkill to, you know, give him the sedative as well. Even his mom, I was thinking once David was dead, I would think she would snap out of it or I don't think she would do anything to harm any of the kids at that point. Yeah. So I was like, did he intend to kill them? Because why did he get his parents involved, you know? Yeah, that's actually, that's a good point. And I think, I think I didn't really come to this idea until the end of the book when I started realizing just how unreliable he is. When we found out the real reason of why Finn pushed him into the river, when Mm -hmm. we find out he locked Finn in his room and then tied him to the radiator because Mm -hmm. he was making too much like ruckus and was going to hurt himself. So then, yeah, so Henry tells us, the reader, that, you know, he wanted to look more like Finn. So he started dyeing his hair. He started going to the gym. He He got procedures done to change his face to look more like him. But then Libby says that he denied all claims that he got any work done to look like Finn. So the truth is very loosey-goosey with Henry. So to Mm -hmm. me, it's just kind of hard to know what's real and what's not. So he says he accidentally gave them the wrong dose. It's a dose that couldn't have killed a cat, but he already tested it on the cat and he knew what killed the cat. So in my mind, he should have known what the right dose would be. So it's just to me like, so I don't know if he did that for sure. Maybe he did and I wouldn't be surprised. Yeah. No, that's an interesting point. Um, It's not to give him a pass, but I just can't help but think had he had a healthy upbringing, if his issues would still manifest that way. Because although, you know, there are multiple times throughout the book where he would say stuff and he would be like, I just realized that's incredibly insensitive. Now finish crying or now, you know, Birdie feels this way. He has a high emotional intelligence and typically with sociopathic behavior, they don't, right? Like, right, yeah. they mimic that. I just couldn't help but think, like, had he had a healthy upbringing, how, would he still be like that to that extent? Yeah, and I think you're totally right, too, because, like, thinking about it from their perspective, these kids grew up, they didn't see any other humans but the people in their house for years at the most crucial developmental points in their life. Mm-hmm. That has to play a role in how you develop and your relationships that you then go on to have with other people. I feel like that has got to have some kind of lasting impact or some kind of effect on the way you developed emotionally and mentally. Absolutely. This book had many plot twists, and I'd love to get into the fact that Lucy's baby is not David's. It's Mm. Finn's. Yeah. Uh, Did not see that coming. That was another point that I was reading in which I audibly gasped. They're so young. They're so young. Like, that's Mm -hmm. so disturbing to me. And also at that point, Finn is very sick. And, you know, he's incredibly malnourished. To that point, that was something I wanted to touch on when we were talking about Henry becoming more manipulative and more and more like David. We find out the reason that Finn is sick is because Henry has been poisoning him. He tried to make a love potion that backfired and started making Finn weak and sick. And instead of stopping it, he continued doing it because he said the weaker that Finn became, the stronger that Henry became as Finn. And he Mm -hmm. wanted to be Finn. He says, my intention was never to kill Finn, but just to be strong enough that I could continue to be him. So Mm. that's just another way of his controlling kind of manipulative behavior coming out and replicating David's behavior in a way. Yeah, that's incredibly disturbing. Just kind of going back with Henry and Finn and Lucy, I also, my thoughts are kind of myrtled in regards to young Lucy because Ultimately, I feel sorry for her. I think she really was heavily brainwashed and manipulated. And just the fact that, you know, she's like 14 years old. Yeah, it was just definitely a plot twist I didn't um, see coming. And, oh, that's another thing I think is indicative for Henry is that he was so mad when he found out. He said he was ready to kill Finn. Mm. And that's what he initially went into the room to do. Oh, that's right. Yeah. And so I just think Henry is capable of a lot more than um, maybe even he thinks he is or even as as we're to believe he is. I feel like Henry himself doesn't. So there's a point in which Henry is very much so driven by 
an emotional response to something, usually negative, that he acts violently, like, you know, he says he intended to kill Finn in that moment or like when he killed Birdie's cat. But I think there's also a part that doesn't realize that he's behaving that way, if that makes sense. Just because the way he describes the series of events, he doesn't realize like how that looks. He just kind of tries to explain away or maybe justify the behavior in such a way where it's like, oh yeah, you know, this just like happened to happen, but it wasn't what I meant to do. We see Henry in that excuse making behavior that we were talking about, even all the way into the present day. So when he runs into Libby and Miller at the house, he presents himself as Finn, Mm -hmm. And then he tells them everything. And then they wake up. And the situation is just weird. They're locked in for starters. They can't find their phones. And, you know, Henry comes up with a reason for all this. Oh, I sleepwalk, so I locked the door. And, oh, your phones are out here charging. You must have just forgotten. He's trying to explain it away in a way that makes it seem like it's not strange. But it is strange. And I'm right back to that unreliable narrator. We know he's lying. You know, he tells them that they fell asleep with their phones on the charger and that he didn't do anything to them or that they were all just drunk, but Mm -hmm. he put a tracking device on their phone and he's listening in through Libby's phone. And that's another thing that we never get explained. I don't even know if uh, Libby and Miller ever realized that he did this. So it's just Mm -hmm. more of like, there are two sides to him and I don't really know which one is correct, if any. It's so interesting for us to get that information about him at the end of the book. And it really just pulls into question everything that he's told us. It almost made me want to read it again with fresh eyes. I think that was another moment that we saw a Henry and David parallel because the fact that he's in an Airbnb, this is not his property. And this man has installed locks from the outside. Yeah, like you said, just kind of really leftover trauma and maybe stunted growth from what happened to him. Definitely. Yeah. So present day, you know, we have Libby, Miller, and what's going on with Lucy? <sighs> Lucy's story, it's its a lot to take in. So she learns that Marco has still been in contact with his father, unbeknownst to her. And he's pretty wealthy, but they were in a like very toxic, abusive, violent relationship. And that's why it ended and why she felt the need to run away. But she's at a point now with her fiddle being broken, nowhere else to turn, that she decides to reach out to Michael and re-enter his life with her children. And so initially she reaches out to Michael to get some money to just get on her feet, get a place for her and the children. But then she reaches out to him again to get the passports. And she realizes that Michael's expecting her to sleep with him again as like a trade-off for getting the passports Mm -hmm. and in that moment as we know she ends up stabbing him yeah so he is assaulting her and she has this moment in her mind where she's like this is not how it's supposed to happen she says like she knew that that's what she came there to do and she was going to do it because she needed to for herself and her children but it was he was being aggressive he thought she was trying to get away from him so he slapped her And then she picks up a knife off the counter and stabs him in the side. I just wasn't expecting that to happen in that moment. It was probably like the first plot twist of the book for me. And so, because I was like, I see her looking at this knife and I was like, and then yeah, she stabs him. Tell me what you thought when you read that. Yeah, I just, um, it was really interesting because like you said, I remember her character also says something, but You know, she goes into this situation knowing what's going to happen. But in that moment, he physically assaults her, starts getting aggressive. It all just kind of happens. And so I was shocked. I'm still shocked that that happened. But it was the catalyst that I think she needed and the story needed to set things into motion. Because at that point, you know, she then goes, gets the kids and they go to England. She also carefully stages the scene. She hides the body very cleverly. That was, I think that was for me too, like the first big plot twist that started kicking off a series of plot twists. Yeah, it's it's for sure, like you said, really when the book picked up momentum um, and things were kind of full speed ahead from there. It gave us further insight into Lucy as a character and showed us how she is willing to do whatever it takes to survive for the sake of not only herself, but for her children. And we're still at this point unsure of her connection to Libby and why it's so important for her to get to London. But dang, if that's any clear indication of how important getting to London is to her... I don't know what it is. And I guess just kind of segueing into London, 
I'm curious to hear your thoughts on Libby and Miller's relationship. Yeah, so there's one part of me that is like, oh, you know, like, it shows Libby's growth of she had this cookie cutter plan for her life, everything is thrown into kind of mayhem, and she learns to let that go. Miller is not the definition of who she saw herself with, but it's someone who makes her happy, which is, I think, ultimately the most important thing. So I get that on one note, but on the other, I just think it's a little weird because he had, I mean, he admits twice that his marriage ended due to his obsession with her family's story. Mm-hmm. And so then to to date the person who's at the focal point of that story is a little bit weird. He was obsessed with this family, obsessed with finding out what happened, and now he's a part of that family. It's just, I think it's a little strange. Like if I was Miller's ex-wife and I mm-hmm. saw on Facebook... He's now dating the baby in a story that he was writing, like that our marriage ended over. It's just, it looks a little weird, like conflict of interest, a little Right. Bit. Yeah, no, I love that uh, you phrase that that way. I'm, I mean, from the outside looking in, that's got to look off. He proves early on that he's trustworthy and he's not a creep or anything, but... Like you said, twice it's mentioned how his obsession upends his marriage. And so for him to go on and continue being obsessed with the story and then even the way that the book ends, that he's still following, trying to figure out where Finn went or he finds where Finn went. I'm like, that's the you know epicenter of your relationship with this man is his obsession with your history. I I have mixed feelings, but I would say tonally it kind of fits with the story because, you know, things are a bit screwy and off kilter. This is definitely very off kilter. So tonally it makes sense in the story, but I don't know that I could be in a relationship with someone who, you know, probably knows more about my life than I do or my upbringing at least. And that's something I wish we would have gotten more of in the book. Two things. I wish we would have gotten more from Clemency and Lucy's perspectives when they were young. I'm sure that was done intentionally, Mm -hmm. Um, but I really would have liked, because we didn't really get much on Clemency at all. Even as an adult, Libby has that one conversation with her and that's it. Also, just the reunion of this family in this way, you know, like they finally all meet and then we just get a flash forward to a year later. But I want to know how did Libby and Lucy's relationship develop? What are Mm -hmm. Libby's feelings about how her mom got pregnant and what happened to her mom as a child and as an adult? We spent so long knowing these characters individually, knowing that they're on this path to each other. And then we kind of are just, we, we, we are skipped over getting the whole portion of what it was finally like when they came together. I agree. And even, yeah, I wouldn't say it was rushed at the end, but there was a lot of gaps missing that I would have liked to be filled in, especially just because, you know, once the part when Lucy, I guess, meets Henry again for the first time after all these years and sees that Henry is now emulating Finn, she even says, I'm scared of him, but that's my brother. But I feel fear right now. Yeah. All of a sudden, they're at the end of Big Happy Family celebrating Libby's birthday. I don't know how realistic. I mean, I guess what happened to them is unreal. So maybe they're coping in their own way. Yeah, it's tough because I'm trying to think of a way it could have ended where I foot, I would have felt more closure. And I think it's, you know, what you're saying, if we just would have got some more details towards the end. But it just felt a little like happy ending. And yeah. this is a lot that's happened, you know. It's we not find a happy out, book, yeah. Right, and that's okay, you know. Some of my mm-hmm. favorite films and stories are tragedies. And, it's you know, I still cry every time I read them or watch the film, but it's impactful. It sits with you. It was designed to be that way. I don't know. The ending, like you said, I was just kind of thinking to myself, is that really how things would have played out? Especially when Lucy and Clemency are you know, having lunch once a month. They just all had such strong feelings towards each other. And I know time heals wounds, but that quickly, you know? Like, how do you move on from that? How does that not fundamentally change your relationship? So it was um, it was an interesting read. It was definitely not what I was expecting. And in a good way, you know, everything doesn't always have to be exactly what you expect. I thought one thing for this and we got another, but not in a bad way. So Mm -hmm. yeah. So don't forget to, if you read the book, check out our Facebook group. We're going to be having some discussions over there about this. We'd love to know what you think. 
Um, we didn't get submissions this week via email, so we don't have emails to read. But just remember, you know, we always post our books in advance. If you have anything you want to share, be sure to email us at booksolidpodcast at gmail.com. Next episode, we are talking about Normal People, the show on Hulu and the book. So if you've read it or you've watched it, please feel free to reach out um, so we can include your response in the episode. And we love hearing differing opinions and viewpoints. So happy reading and we'll see you next episode. Thank you guys so much for hanging out with us today. For more updates, you can be sure to follow us on Twitter at BookSolidPod on Instagram at Book Solid Podcast, like us on Facebook at Book Solid Podcast, and also join our group. Please stay tuned after the outro for more information on our donation of the week. For this week's donation, we have chosen the Black Mamas Matter Alliance. This organization aims to advocate, drive research, and shift culture for Black maternal health rights and justice. Their goal is to create a world where Black mamas have the resources and respect to thrive before, during, and after pregnancy. We have chosen this organization because their cause is very personal to us, as we've witnessed Black mamas in our families deal with discrimination and prejudice throughout their journeys to motherhood. In addition, while we aren't mothers ourselves, we have both experienced discrimination firsthand within the healthcare system. According to an article on the Commonwealth Fund's website, Black women are three times more likely to die of pregnancy-related causes than white women, even after accounting for income, education, and access to other resources. The last thing that any person should have to worry about when bringing new life into the world and celebrating what may be one of the happiest moments of their life is whether or not the color of their skin is going to affect the treatment that they receive. For more information on the Black Mamas Matter Alliance and how to donate, please visit our podcast show notes, and we'll see you on our next episode.